Welcome to the Social Exchange Podcast. We're here on Town Meeting TV in the studio in Burlington, Vermont. I'm joined by my friend, Dr. Rick Barnett. How are you doing, Rick? Good, Zach. Thanks for having me on your show again. You act super natural. That was take two, and you act super natural about that. <laughs> um, well, we're gonna, we want to talk about psychedelics and the psychedelic movement, which you've had a, a huge part in. Um, can you tell a little bit about your history? Because I know you're, I know you as somebody who, well, of course, practices clinical psychology, and also you're a self-described adrenaline junkie, and also uh, you like to have your nose in the books learning new things, which, by the way, I have a four-year-old daughter who the other day was saying to her teacher, I know more things than my dad, and I've been trying to teach her that it's not about how many things you know, it's about how interested you are to learn new things, right. which you seem very interested in. Yeah. So uh, I'm curious about your background and you know, maybe I know a little bit too much, curse of knowledge, and if you could inform people. Then also I'm interested how you became so interested in this new topic. You kind of dove in off the, you know, head first into psychedelic research. Yeah, yeah. So my, my background is uh, as a psychologist, and uh, you know that I've uh, been deeply immersed in the world of addiction. Uh, that's where I sort of earned my stripes, so, so to say, in the, uh, in the professional world, starting off as a, an addictions counselor in, in New York City and then going on to get a master's degree and, and a doctoral degree. Um, so that's where, I, that's where I spend most of my time, in, in the mental health clinical world. And uh, outside of that, I guess I am an adrenaline <laughs> junkie. I do like to do uh, fun, daring things, so I'm somewhat of a risk taker. Um, and psychedelics really, yeah, they, they came back into the, into the foreground of my awareness, uh, very front and central back in 2019. Uh, I heard Michael Pollan speak at uh, an American Psychological Association conference uh, because his book, How to Change Your Mind, uh, sometimes called the Pollan Effect on the psychedelic world because many people have heard of the book, How to Change Your Mind. Right. So I saw him speak and uh, that really catalyzed a lot of things for me because I'd heard about the book, hearing him speak. And what I mean by catalyzed to that for me is because I w was aware back in, I would say 1999, 2000, I was uh, teaching resident physicians about drug use, addiction, treatment, assessment, that kind of thing. And, and one of the things I would do in part of my presentation would, would give a drug update. And I learned that MDMA, uh, that's 3,4-methylene dioxymethamphetamine, that is uh, ecstasy, molly, was being studied for post-traumatic stress disorder. So that was part of my little presentation, but that's just a little, like a little nugget of my broader presentation. It was really in 2018, 2019 when it started to come into the foreground. And it goes all the way back to my youth Again, being a risk taker, I uh, definitely developed a problem with alcohol and drugs when I was younger as part of that maybe novelty-seeking, sensation-seeking personality and uh, got into recovery at age 20. I, I put aside all my drugs and alcohol at that time. W one of the drugs that I misused heavily was LSD. Uh, but I could also say that uh, if it wasn't for LSD, I would say that um, I would not be a psychologist today. I probably would not be in recovery from addiction today, even though I misused the drug Why is that? massively. Uh, because, you know, LSD is one of those things that for me, um, I think, permanently changed my outlook on life. It just made me more open to different perspectives. I can remember after my first LSD use at age 15, uh, I thought I was really messed up forever. I, I didn't think the effect was ever going to wear off because I was looking at everything and, and interpreting the world totally differently, probably for months. You know, is this ever going to go away? And it wasn't a bad thing. It was just mm -hmm. a curious thing. You were talking about your four-year-old daughter. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that idea of being perpetually curious about things. I, I'm definitely always learning new things. I heard about this thing called brain spotting recently, which has been around forever, but it's really interesting related to um, EMDR for, for post-traumatic stress disorder. So anyway, I came full circle, had used psychedelics when I was a kid. They deeply impacted my life, positively and negatively. And then here we are, you know, decades later with this huge psychedelic renaissance, this, this research, a uh, flood of research on psychedelic compounds to treat so many different issues. And uh, it's just become really exciting. When you, um, when I said, I guess I'm the one who said it, but when you say you're immersed in psychedelic research, what does that mean? What are you up to? Yeah, I'm not actually doing. What are you up to? Yeah, I'm not. I'm not <laughs> doing uh, actual scientific research myself. Um, I am following the research very closely, hmm. and I founded the co-founded the Psychedelic Society of Vermont. In as soon as I finished a year-long training program, it was actually three years ago this month or last month 
that I was on the show and we were talking about psychedelic assisted psychotherapy at the onset of this year long training program that I was about to embark yes, on. Yes, I was yeah. seeing you off. You're about to fly away to start learning. Yes, exactly. Like I was saying goodbye. <laughs> yeah, and then, and then COVID happened and so it was all done online. Uh, but I learned so much during that process. And so at the end of that, we, we founded the Psychedelic Society of Vermont. And since then, we've been meeting regularly, a group of healthcare professionals, uh, learning about the research, learning about all the advocacy efforts around the country, uh, going to conferences, uh, putting on webinars, and putting on our own conferences. So we had one last uh, June in Stowe, and we have another conference coming up in September of this year called the Soul Equinox event mm. in Stowe, and it's on the fall equinox. And we have the leading researchers uh, from Rick Doblin from MAPS, which is the multidisciplinary multidisciplinary association of psychedelic studies. We have Julie Holland, who's written many books on, a psychiatrist who's written many books and been a lead researcher for MAPS. Mm -hmm. We have Rosalind Watts, uh, who's a lead, was a re lead researcher on psilocybin in, uh, in the UK. Ben Sessa, we have Janice Phelps. We have so many really cool names and people coming to this event. So that's what the Psychedelic Society of Vermont has been up to. That's what I've been up to, deeply, deeply immersed in learning as much as I can about psychedelic research psychedelic therapy, um, and also to some extent harm reduction because psychedelics have been, become such a buzz buzzword and such a well-known thing these days that a lot of people are, for whatever reason, however they're doing it, they're getting access to mushrooms and LSD and MDMA and they're using it, you know, their personal use. And it's really helpful, I think, to have people like me, healthcare professionals who are informed about drug-drug mm -hmm. interactions, about how does one use psychedelics in the safest possible way, optimizing their effects, because it's so much not only about the drug itself, but about the, what they call set and setting in which the drug use takes place. So, so you, you can help inform, you don't have to do anything with policy shift or paradigm shifts in therapeutic practice or anything to provide information to the public who correct. is already using these drugs. Yes. Do, are you saying, do you, do you think people have more access to them now since there's been a buzz than before? Or are you just saying people generally have access to them and they're interested now? I think that's a really good question because I'm going back to, uh, what, 30 plus years ago. And for some reason, I had plenty of access to psychedelics back then. And that was, the, you know, the height of the drug war and the, you know, just say no movement. Mm -hmm. So is there more access now? I would say it seems as though, I mean, maybe people would argue, like, I can't find any, where do I get this stuff? You know, and I, I can't help anybody with that. Yeah, but, I took my question. Right, <laughs> darn, <laughs> all right, end of interview. Um, but I, I do think because it's become so popular, you know, mushrooms, for example, uh, they're very easy to grow. You have to follow a certain protocol. You can buy actually spores, I think, legally online, and you can set up your own little closet situation. I don't recommend it because, <laughs> you're, because you're, you're guessing my question. So do you recommend the, the way to do that? Yeah. I don't. I don't recommend it. I think that it can go wrong. You can grow mold. I think if you mm -hmm. don't have the right. Um, system set up. So it's not like super easy to do, but it's it's pretty basic. And so I do think people are experimenting growing their own mushrooms just as as an example uh, in terms of more access. Uh, you know, you know, people are actually buying um, lots of psychedelics online. Um, you can get it in in chocolate, like psilocybin chocolates. Again, these aren't legal ways to do it. Um, sometimes it's just blatantly sold online. Sometimes you have to go in hidden places to find it. Right, you but didn't influence this, but it's happening. It's happening, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, maybe people are more out about it now. Yeah. Because there's buzz about it being an effective way of doing one thing or another. Yeah, and people are actually so bold that they're setting up actual storefront windows in the United States or in Canada where it's not quite fully legal yet, maybe just decriminalized, and they're still getting arrested for doing that because you, they're not legal drugs. But people are so convinced that this is the right thing to do that they're willing to stick their neck, neck out and just open up a storefront and sell mushrooms. Or, you know, there are people doing uh, work underground, what's called underground. It's not legal, but they believe that it's helping people and they want to be able to try to help people. I joke sometimes that I work with people with addictions because I enjoy having employment and that's not something we're going to solve ever. Um, do you feel that way about this or, or is there some goal? In other words, what are you hoping to accomplish with what you're doing now in the realm of psychedelics? What, what I think is really important in the realm of psychedelics is to, to try to prevent too much um, dichotomous thinking or to try to prevent uh, infighting because there's a lot of people who are have a lot of diverse interests in psychedelics it could be corporate 
corporate uh, structures, uh, capitalistic structures that want to extract the value out of uh, patenting and selling psychedelics, pharma companies. So they have a vested interest in it. You have indigenous cultures who have a vested interest in protecting their lineage and not having it be pillaged like everything else has been pillaged by uh, Western societies. You have um, advocacy groups that simply want it to be decriminalized or legalized for personal use. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you have the medical model, and it's all about going down that research track and just getting it FDA approved so we can offer it medically in medical settings and reimbursed by insurance companies. So you have all these people and all these vested interests sort of trying to do their land grab or put their you know, flag in the ground and say, this is, this is what we stand for. And what I like to do is I like to bring the strengths and weaknesses of all the approaches together and say, hey, look, no one's got the corner of the market here. We all have something to offer. There's no need to throw shade on this, this side or that side. It happens all the time, and maybe some of that's necessary, so you can't stop that from happening. But what I like to do is try to give voice to all sides and try to keep it uh, positive on the up and up so that we can bring it forward in the healthiest way possible. Otherwise, we run the risk of you know, stepping on each other's toes or going sideways like it went in the 60s and shutting everything down again, and we just don't want that to happen. Am I extracting out of that that you want psychedelics exist? People use them with greater or less utility. You'd like to see people get value out of them one way or another, and, and you think you could make that happen. Um, you think you could encourage that and guide that along in some way, and this entire group, anyone who has a stakeholder in this, uh, in the psychedelic movement, could also help guide it, and you're trying to prevent what did you say, dichotomous thinking from thwarting that effort? Yeah, uh, too much um, infighting or, or uh, uh, being too rigid around w one particular model or perspective. And that's what we tend to do as human beings. We, we uh, identify with a particular group and then that becomes our tribe and then everybody else is you know, wrong or <laughs> whatever. Um, just to give an example of that, there is a bill, uh, there are two bills in the state of Vermont. This is Town Meeting TV, and we're still in the middle of a legislative session here. Uh, there's a Senate Bill 114, and there's a House Bill 371, I believe. And they're both bills that effectively remove psilocybin from the list of illegal drugs in the state. So effectively make psilocybin mushrooms legal uh, for any purpose, selling, using, possession, <laughs> it just removes psilocybin from the list, and also sets up a psilocybin uh, psychotherapy advisory group. So a list of stakeholders or a list, list of board members are suggested to serve on this working group to go ahead and put forth a report to the legislature saying, you know, if there is to be psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy in the state of Vermont, this is how we think it should look, based on other models and stuff like that. And so I was involved trying to get with the lead sponsor uh, Representative Chip Troiano uh, engaged on this subject back in the spring and explicitly had conversations about the medical model versus like a decriminalization model and where I really landed in terms of at least getting this off the ground is like let's just look at psilocybin alone as a psychedelic. Let's not look at without LS considering LSD oh, oh, I see. Yeah, without considering LSD or DMT or all the other drugs. Um, just look at psilocybin and we know that it's on a track towards medicalization. It will be likely FDA approved for treatment for various conditions in 2025, 2026, 2027. That's on track. In the meantime, there's enough evidence already in the research to show that it is safe, that it is effective, and that it can be used personally, it can be used ceremonially in safe ways. So is there a way to put forth a bill that allows for uh, legal or, or decriminalized use um, without the fear of these massive penalties so that people who are doing the work or want to do the work um, aren't quite as uh, scared to do so because of the, uh, the legal status of the drug. It seems like the, the, those two views in some ways, I can imagine a scenario where they're not compatible in terms of medicalization on one hand, legalization, decriminalization on the other. So is it... Um, I mean, is that ever at odds? So you would like to see things, don't let me put words in your mouth. I think I would like to see things happen where access to psilocybin opens up, access to drugs in general, that's my take, I, I don't know, I'm a rebel, yes, yes, open up yes. so that then whatever happens with them can, exi you know, can exist sort of in a natural trajectory. Yeah. That maybe doesn't coexist with somebody who says, I'm worried about the legalization of drugs 
And so I think a medical model would be a good first pass at trying to do something with them. Yeah. So uh, don't you think there's some natural disconnect there? And how do how do you are you getting people to coexist in that in that line of thinking? Right. And I think it's just a matter of trying to hold both perspectives as um, each independent of each other and valid approaches to access. Mm -hmm. So if the main issue is access then a medical model approach is one avenue for that, and it's a valid one, so we should support that. We should get behind that. Actually, if it wasn't for all the research in this area that's under the umbrella of medical research, we would not be where we are today. So I think we owe a debt of gratitude to science and the research that is being done so that we are on this pathway towards uh, legal medical access to these compounds in a safe and effective way. The, the one way, and it sounds sort of uh, lame, but um, the one way in which they may be across purposes is that those people who um, believe it should be a medical model only will say that um, that using getting access to psilocybin out there in the natural world somehow um, by uh, unscrupulous dealers. It, it's, it's dangerous and you're going to get uh, psilocybin laced with fentanyl and uh, there's going to be all kinds of chaos that's going to uh, unfold because it's this unregulated, you know, legal access, you know, anybody can grow it and use it on their own and it's going to be terrible for people. That's why we need the medical model and we need the FDA approval process because that way we can keep it safe and effective in that way. And then the people who are on the side of legalization or decriminalization, personal use, that side of things, they will say that it's all just corporate greed, big pharma, the medical industrial complex mm -hmm. is just trying to sort of commandeer this natural compound that nobody should own per se, nobody should regulate, mm -hmm. it should be just available to everybody. And so you could see how both sides have their strengths and weaknesses and I just, I just tend to lean on the side of like, let's get, like you, like let's get access to these drugs, let's, let's raise awareness have have uh, sessions like this, you know, interviews like this, do webinars, offer programs to train people to raise their awareness about how to use these drugs safely, what, what other drugs do they interact with so you're not messing around too much with your internal biochemistry, uh, you know, that you're improving uh, community life and social life and, you know, you're, you're just handling it in a thoughtful way. It is possible to do that. There's always going to be unscrupulous players, whether it's on the medical side or it's in the, in the natural world. You know, it just happens. But we shouldn't, like, throw stones at each other across the, across the different models because one model is better than the other. It just doesn't serve anybody. So wh where is your stance on legalization of drugs in general now? I remember we sat here, God, I, I don't know how many years ago, and we were talking about uh, heroin-assisted therapy or heroin assisted treatment or heroin assisted places um, you didn't disagree with it but you were hesitant to sign on the dotted line for something like that do you, has that evolved at all or is, are you still kind of there like some psychedelics and some drugs uh, I mean gung-ho let's make sure the access is available something like heroin not so much well, no, I think I remember that conversation well because it was around the time that um, there was a lot of, uh, it was in the late uh, 2018, early 2000, 2019, where I think you and I were on the same page. There was a, there's, has been a lot of emphasis on the opioid epidemic around medication-assisted treatment and uh, easy access to things like Suboxone, uh, Buprenorphine, or Methadone. And, you know, you and I were like, hey, that's great. People should have access to these things, but is that really solving the issue here? Right. And the, uh, the region of Burlington recently shot down a measure or some ballot initi initiative or something to open a safe use site so people can go to a location and use heroin safely without fear of being uh, arrested or anything like that. And you and I were both on the same page about that. That should be, that should be uh, initiated somewhere in Vermont. I think there is, there's still ongoing efforts to do that. I believe that is a viable model. I've always believed in what's called safe consumption sites mm -hmm. or safe injection sites, safe use areas, um, safe spaces to use drugs. And I'm a firm believer in that, just like I believe in heroin assisted treatment in a medical model. So to extrapolate from that to go into full blown, just let's just legalize all drugs so that there's a regulated market for heroin so that you and your partner can go down to the pharmacy uh, and over-the-counter order, you know, 
10 grams of heroin, let's say, for example, for your whatever supply or um, a certain amount of cocaine. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's, that's a model that I still would support. Uh, it just, I think that, I don't know if society is ready for that, you know, and that would be a tricky, um, a tricky thing to, to implement. Just, yeah. I think yeah. because of the lineage of the drug war and everything, it's just a really, you know, we know that like, heroin containing products and cocaine containing products were widely available in the late 1800s early 1900s yep. so there's no reason why we couldn't eventually get back to something like that but i think it would be a it's a heavy lift so it's not that i disagree with that it's just like how would that happen i could see decriminalization as a pathway towards that yeah. decriminalizing all drugs adults everywhere are sort of ready for that i mean not everywhere adults you can find adults in given places who are right now using illicit drugs and feel like they do them with virtually no impunity you know they're, they're living their lives um, but you may, maybe you're right maybe society's not ready for it it's certainly it's like uh, that's what I believe and I don't mind being vocal and still I mean I'm here it's just me and you and the, the, I feel weird about even saying it like oh my god what's it, where's this gonna, conversation gonna go <laughs> but I think it's a misunderstanding in large part of what addiction is which I'm like so distracted by uh, I don't know if it's distracted or hypervigilant about in terms of what it means, what addiction means, because people think um, there are better and worse drugs, some things addict you more, there's some ineluctable draw of a drug that gets you hooked on it, and uh, I don't buy it, mm -hmm. any of it. That leads me into thinking about uh, psychedelics, and we had this conversation before where, um, what, what did uh, Carl Hart call it? Anyway, he psychedelic made... Psychedelic exceptionalism. Right, psych right, psychedelic exceptionalism. Yeah, yeah, right. Dr drug, drug exceptionalism. Yeah, like, yeah. well, the, the, my the, drug the, is better than your the drug. The fallacy, yeah. right, that, that I'm, pro, I'm a proponent of this drug, and that's because this one's not addictive, and that one is. And it's just um, it's a bad argument, I think. And so I imagine that there's infighting or misinformation or just different opinions within uh, the movement that you're trying to help guide. Uh, what, how do you think about that? And do, are there those conversations going on? Yeah, I mean, so psychedelics, uh, if you look at, and I don't know if it's, I'd be curious to see what Dr. Carl Hart has to say about this, but there are charts out there that show a couple, a couple of different charts. One will show, um, in terms of like the, the, uh, the incidents or the likely, the, the harms or the addictive potential of various drugs. I think maybe the harms that come from, it's the harms. There's a chart that shows the harms of various drugs, using various drugs. And like alcohol and cigarettes are like at the top of the list. And then underneath that, you get heroin, cocaine, and you go down the line and you get all the way down to like psilocybin, which is like basically zero harm. You know, LSD, basically like zero harm. So you get to the psychedelics and you're like, well, there's hardly any harm that comes from them. So I think that's in part where the psychedelic exceptionalism comes in. It's like, look, look at this chart. Hardly any harm comes from this, but these other ones, namely two of the top top ones, are legal mm -hmm. drugs. So you know the whole that whole argument is really weird because you've got legal drugs that are devastating, you've got illegal drugs that are anyway, it's it's confusing. The other thing that I would wonder uh, what researchers think about, and this was from Herb Kleber, who used to be at Columbia University, passed away several years ago. Uh, great researcher, great guy. And he used to always talk about the, um, the uh, conversion rate from first use of a drug to becoming addicted to the drug or ever having had a problem with the drug over the course of a lifetime. So if you look at the number of people who have ever tried alcohol, who've ever tried nicotine, who've ever tried cocaine, and then you look at the number of people who, uh, through data or whatever, have developed a, a problem with it, a diagnosed substance use disorder with it. Uh, you have a conversion rate of like basically addictive pr propensity for drugs. And you have nicotine at the top of the list. Like one in three people who ever try nicotine apparently go on to develop a problem with it. And then you have something like opioids. And this is debatable, been debated a lot in the uh, opioid epidemic era that we're living through. Something like one in four, one in five, one in six people who ever try opioids will go on to become develop a problem with it. Something like one in six, one in seven for cocaine. Uh, and, and the list goes on and on and on. And I, again, I don't know like what that is supposed to mean, but I think it, it builds this narrative that some drugs are more addictive than other drugs. It's a bad category. Yeah. First of all, the one in four thing with opioids, it's, it's just not right. It's terrible. It's, yeah. it's not the right. Yeah. And I don't know, those other statistics you listed off, uh, maybe I'm naive about it, pro probably aren't quite right either. Yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I understand what you're saying. But it's the so, narrative that's built around but it that, is kind the, of, that kind I, of data. I understand yeah. what you mean. So the, yeah, the larger point is that 
what you really want to do with things that people may or may not have access to but want uh, is to try to allow people to get it and understand how to use the thing safely. Um, yeah. So that's a pretty libertarian stance. I don't know. I yeah. don't know where you fall politically, but we won't talk about it. <laughs> um, well, I think it's also just related to this idea of, you know, are psychedelic drugs addictive, mm -hmm. right? That, that, um, that question is an interesting one because I'm somebody, I think like you, that we as human beings, some of us may or may be more or less predisposed to um, engaging in certain behaviors or using certain substances in a way that may not be healthy. Yeah, yeah. Some, if, it, if you're asking, is it something you could become preoccupied with? Yeah. To, to some kind of devastation, yeah. you know, more or less. Yeah. When then, then the answer is sort of obvious. Yeah, right? yeah. People become obsessed with psychedelics and they want to use them all the time. You know, whether they're physiologically addictive is sort of irrelevant. It's just like, it's, it's an experience. Right. You know, if, if psychedelics are anything, they offer uh, an individual an experience, right? The Jimi Hendrix experience, you know, it, you go on a trip, you go on a journey. And so can people get addicted to that process? Well, a lot of people say no, because some of those journeys, the trips that people go on are terrifying. Yeah. You know, you either see God or the devil or snakes or, you know, entities or whatever, and it's terrifying and it can jar your, your psyche and your soul for, for weeks afterwards. Who could ever get addicted to that? Fuck, excuse me. Some people, some people love that. You know, some yeah. people actually love the challenge of going through these difficult things, and they want to do it every day. I had a patient come to me uh, about a year ago, and he was using um, two highly potent psychedelic drugs, DMT and 5-MeO DMT, mm -hmm. several times a day for months straight. That's just not a healthy amount of using no, no. these very highly potent. Now, he did so in such a way that it actually relieved him of his alcohol use. His liver was failing, and he was looking desperately to find ways to stop drinking. Mm. And somehow he found uh, the research on psychedelics in the treatment of alcohol use disorder. And he somehow stumbled across some of these drugs, uh, DMT, and started using them regularly. So great, he, he did stop using alcohol, his liver healed, uh, and he was using what I would call uh, psychedelic drugs a bit, a bit excessively, and I, and I let him know that. But you know, is it better than like, having his liver fail and you know, right. dying from alcohol poisoning? Yeah. I would say, arguably, it's probably a better route for the guy. I understand as a clinician that you go that route. It's like whatever goofy method you come up with, of making your life better or doing what you want to do, you'll land there. Maybe you'll give some suggestions like, you know, if I were your parent, I probably wouldn't say, do this, this is the best way to get off it, but I'm not you. And so, right, there's, there are more and less harmful ways to do anything in the world, and I guess that's a, a moot argument. Yeah. I want to get, let's get away from the negativity bias, uh, explaining away negativity biases. Um, and can we get existential? This is, uh, is it too obvious of a question to ask, what's going on? when people are enjoying psychedelics in terms of uh, therapeutically. So when somebody is taking a psychedelic and that opens some sort of mindset for them that they're able to move on or go somewhere positive, what, explain what you think is going on there in uh, two minutes. Right. Two minutes. <laughs> well, I mean, I think it's, it's uh, really where a lot of the research comes from, actually. There's this thing called the mystical experience, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a mystical experience questionnaire that in the research that you can sort of measure how mystical was your experience with this. But, you know, what, what we do find, and I'm borrowing this from Roland Griffiths, who's, the, you know, probably the, one of the, the most important figures in the psychedelic renaissance, um, you know, he, he says and repeatedly in all of his talks that in those early studies and still today, what they find is that people who have uh, robust psychedelic experiences will rate that experience in the same area as the birth of their child, as the loss of a loved one, uh, any other sort of significant li life event that is life changing. So to, to actually take a drug one time and to have it rank as one of the most important, top five most ex important experiences of your life is pretty significant. Mm -hmm. And so that's what people report when you have an optimal psychedelic experience in the, using the right uh, mindset, in the right setting, with the right support systems. Um, you can really produce a profound, life-changing experience where someone is all of a sudden opened up to all kinds of new perspectives and uh, a willingness to be more curious about their life, about their death, to face death more peacefully, uh, to face their troubles more peacefully, to, to learn to look at their alcohol use or drug use differently so that maybe it seems less appealing because they had this 
really deep, profound, philosophical, mystical, mystical experience under the influence of psychedelics. So th that's the ballpark of what people are saying is so therapeutic or, or potentially life, positively life-changing about these experiences. It's like having that sort of that new perspective opened up. You're being disrupted from your usual ruminative, you know, habit loops and your thinking and your behaviors and that's blown out of the water and all of a sudden you come back and you're like, wow, I feel different. I'm thinking about myself and the world differently. It's very significant. I'm going to break the fourth wall for a second. Kevin, we, I blew it and went over time already. Should we just extend it and relax or is it, should, can we wrap up? Okay. Or if we're going to extend. I'm going to, we're going to kick back and, and talk about this for a second. Okay. Um, that, so the way you describe it, it's easy to mistake that for something mystical happening. It's something awe-inspiring that's happening. But um, the way I think about psychedelics, and um, I've experimented, and that benefit that you get from it, it's not different to me rationally than something like a cognitive behavioral therapy or some way of thinking about a problem or a situation or an experience differently than I would have before. Uh, what do you think about that? Is there something more profound and powerful about a psychedelic experience, or is it a different means to the same end as you might get by changing your thinking any other way? I would say that I strongly believe that it's a different means to the same ends. In other words, I agree with you 100% that um, you don't have to take a psychedel psychedelic drug to have an experience, whether instantaneous or over a longer period of time, a series of m smaller experiences, that either gradually or suddenly have, uh, produce a profound shift in your consciousness, the way of thinking about yourself, others, the world, the future, that kind of stuff. So cognitive behavioral therapy, other types of therapies. There's a lot of um, consciousness changing or consciousness raising activities that people can do that don't involve drugs. Certain types of meditation. Uh, there's something called holotropic breath work or breath work exercises, uh, kundalini dancing, some yoga, uh, yeah, other dance uh, processes, so many different things out there that can produce these profound mystical experiences, life-changing experiences. So I do believe, even though I would say I am a psychedelic enthusiast um, and I'm a proponent of them uh, being used in healthy ways and certainly following the research, but they're ultimately just a tool. They're just a tool among many tools and we have a lot of tools. Um, I don't think one is necessarily better than the other. Um, psychedelics do have certain benefits over others and uh, maybe some drawbacks uh, compared to others. Can we trade stories for a minute? Sure. So I'll tell mine first so you can figure out something in the queue to, to do. I'm going to tell you the most practical experience of somebody completely changing their thinking and it involves addiction. And you may have heard me say it before or write this down before um, because I, I try to draw it out of, I work with Dr. Stanton Peel and we, do a, we have an addiction program called the Life Process Program. And one of the examples we use about a values change is his uncle, Ozzy. Oscar was his name. And he was, uh, I'm not going to tell this part yet. He smoked every day for some number of years, 30 years, 40 years, or something like that. And I mean, like two packs a day. Had every reason in the world that you might think of to quit. You know, it was before the Surgeon General's warning, but it was, people knew at this time that it was probably not good for you to be huffing and smoking and tobacco smoke all day long. Kids grandkids in the house and he's always smoking around them. Um, he, you know, developed a cough and all these things. It was definitely impairing his life in some way, but he never considered maybe I should quit. He just whole hog, you know, I'll start just smoking, I'll keep smoking two packs a day. Um, he got to a juncture where he was paying, they raised the price of cigarettes when he used to get them out of those machines and someone teased him. They said, uh, you know, there's Ozzy, he's a sucker for the big tobacco industry. And he quit then. He, except somebody said, so you're going to toss that pack of cigarettes? It's like, well, I'll waste, you know, 10 cents or whatever it was. So he smoked that pack. And then he quit. Never smoked a cigarette again. And uh, at age 90 or something, Stanton, my colleague, asked him, remember when you used to smoke? I said, wow, I used to smoke? You know, he's getting old and he couldn't even remember it. Life-changing experience. The reason was, he's a big union guy. It's kind of, like, kind of a commie. So the idea that, when somebody just brought it to the fore that, man, you're a sucker for this big company, he's like, that's it. And probably he had, this thought had been percolating for a long time in some respect. You know how, well, you're a clinical psychologist, what am I explaining to you? But, you know, just for the masses, <laughs> that, you know, those thoughts can be 
just drumming around in there and you don't know how to exercise them exactly so dissonance will take hold. You'll try to convince yourself that you know maybe I shouldn't do this or maybe I am doing the right thing. I think eventually that caught up with them and that one big statement thought I'm seeing this totally differently now. I mean, it wasn't a problem. I think he felt like crap for a few days and then he just stopped smoking the rest of his life. Mm -hmm. So that's a super practical example of something that I hear similar stories where people expedite the process by doing something like a psychedelic experience. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, I'm sure you have uh, something, some, some experience that you know somebody has had uh, that you could tell. Well, we're, we're either related to psychedelics or not? I'm thinking about addiction or just, uh, I guess not, it doesn't have to be addiction. Yes, related to psychedelics and a time that you've witnessed, experienced, or heard about, researched about, that somebody has made a profound life change or, or experience change or belief system change. I know the husband of a colleague of mine uh, three years ago uh, did 5-MeO uh, DMT, which is a very, very powerful, uh, probably the most powerful psychedelic there is on the planet as far as we know so far. Um, and he was, uh, he had a problem with alcohol for 40 some years. He was in his early 60s. Um, he did 5-MeO DMT, which is again, to be doing that at that age and being relatively uh, naive to psychedelics highly recommended. was uh, <laughs> not, not recommended, but he did it and he, he hasn't drank since. He had a profound experience with the 5-MeO DMT and he just stopped drinking. What, what do you say about it? I mean, what, what he just, real, he just realized that it, I mean, something, something crystallized for him that he realized through that experience that he was killing himself with alcohol and that it had no place in his life anymore. So that was that was like amazing to hear a, a non psychedelic experience just to relate to uh, Uncle Ozzy. Um, I had a patient years ago who um, had a problem with cannabis and he was actually seeing me for his cannabis use disorder. Uh, some people don't believe you can develop a, a problem with cannabis. Ah, but, we covered that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I do believe uh, people do develop an unhealthy relationship with cannabis. And this guy certainly did. He was coming to me for help for that. And at some point, you know, we'd been in working together weekly for, you know, four or five months. And it was causing real problems with his, uh, in his marriage. And at one point, I just spontaneously said, you know, let me just pr propose a scenario to you. Um, because what he would do, he'd often sit around uh, at home, and uh, he loved his home life. Uh, he loved cooking dinner, and he loved sitting, watching uh, CNN and that kind of stuff. And I said to him, uh, let me just propose a scenario to you. What would you, wh what do you see yourself, what would you prefer? Would you rather be alone in the woods, by yourself, no family, no wife, with a big bag of weed, you could smoke as much cannabis as you want, or would you rather be home happy with your wife? Mm. And, it, and you know, he, he, he sat there for a second, he's like, and he started crying. He said, you know what? Honestly, the first thing that came to my mind was to be alone in the woods with a bag of weed. And that thought was like mortifying to him. Mm. And he just stopped smoking weed. After that, he was like, oh my God, I can't believe I actually, that was my first thought that that's what I really want, is to be alone with a bag of weed and not have my wife and, and family and stuff. And so he stopped, I mean, that was just an existential moment, kind of like that's being a, a sucker for the unions. He was like, a, he felt like he was a sucker for the cannabis. And he was just like, I don't want to do this anymore. And he stopped using cannabis. That's an interesting question to pose, you know, somebody giving them a temporal context. Obviously, if somebody is addicted to cannabis and they're doing it despite whatever negative things are happening, they value it in some way. They value something that it's giving them. So the fact that that was immediately on his mind, well, at least he didn't say no-brainer, the weed, man, yeah. you know, but um, that, that's, a, that's a cool way to open up people's thinking. Yeah, so, for someone else, that might not have to produce the same effect, but sure, for some sure. reason for him, it did. Yeah. Sure, yeah, that's interesting. So with psychedelic-assisted therapy, do you see that as someone's having a mind-opening, perhaps, experience or a different way of thinking about things? And then therapeutically, you can ask a question like that, and maybe perhaps they're more open to answering it in a... In a in an open-minded way. Well, it's interesting because um, I would say that through my learning about psychedelics and psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy, yeah. the kind of therapy that uh, it is, that in, in practice, is a very non-directive, non-linear, non-interventional uh, approach. So someone's, uh, someone the, with the way the research is designed, they come into a, a, a living room like setting. It's comfortable. Mm. They put eye shades on. They put headphones on. There's two people sitting there next to them. They've ingested the drug. They wait for the drug to start affecting them. And the people who are there as the therapist are really just sitting there in case anything comes up. 
to soothe them or to um, gently just be present, physically present with them, but not be like, so remember we were talking about your trauma when you were three years old? You know, how's that feeling right now? <laughs> Listen, <know? laughs> that's funny you say that because in my mind, I wasn't thinking at all that the, like uh, one of the options would be while you're tripping your face, you know, someone's talking to you. Right. I wasn't thinking that, but I guess that does, I mean, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know how it does work. So, so there's a, so there's a way of doing it that Someone's guiding you if you need it. Yeah, Someone's and so there, so you might safety feeling. yeah you might take your eye shades off, you might take your headphones off, and be like, you know, I could just keep seeing this image of this this dragon with this tail, and you know, he seems to be smiling, and I just don't, you know, but I'm feeling sad. I, I just feel like crying, and you know, as a therapist, you're just like, oh, suck it up. Okay, no. yeah, no, right. I can't. I don't know why I can't be serious right now. <laughs> no, you just sit there and you're just like, you know, that's. That's good. Are you, you know, how are you doing? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And just let them process it. You're just present. You don't really say or do much other than, you know, just, yeah, be present with them. And then if, if there's too much um, distress, then you try to soothe them. There's usually um, some consents around any kind of therapeutic touch that would be consensual. Um, there's protocol. A lot of preparation goes into this, a lot of preparation. So you sort of foresee any potential problems that could come up. Or someone is just like super talkative and they're like, take the eye shades off and no music and I just want to chit chat, blah, blah, blah. And so as a therapist, you might want to gently redirect them back to the sort of doing the inner work. Because one of the things that a lot of people don't realize when they think about psychedelics is a lot of people associate psychedelic use with concerts or campfires and hanging out with your friends and yeah. you know lots of colors and strange things happening and that's a very externalized experience and I think that's a valuable experience and it's recreational and fun or can be it can be very disturbing too but you know that's what a lot of people think of as psychedelics so when you take a psychedelic and you're blocking out all sensory inputs right, right. you're not being distracted it's all this stuff inwardly coming into your mind and you you can't see anything and all you're hearing is a, a playlist that may or may not be sort of more or less ambient noise coming through this gently melodic um, it's a very different experience and people just don't really once I say it out loud you're like oh of course but people don't register that you know they just think of like psychedelics oh yeah you just go hang out with your friends and take some acid or take some mushrooms and <laughs> start laughing or yeah, yeah, whatever it's a caricature associated with yeah. it we used to, uh, uh, somebody I know used to at, at, at festivals or places that we'd go if if the group was using psychedelics, there would always be one person who wasn't. We called that person the caddy. The caddy? Someone who understood it. Right. And so it would be able to kind of nurture the experience for people and not, you know, knew the right thing to say that wouldn't, you know, explode their mind, especially because of all the sensory input. Yeah. Do you know, I uh, mean, I don't know, is it blowing up anyone's spot to ask, are the therapists who you know who are interested in providing psychedelic-assisted therapy are they in tune with that feeling of taking psychedelics and what that feels like? Yeah, I think that that's an important question. And actually, that has been researched. There was a paper that came out recently. There's been a lot of discussion around that in terms of all these training programs that are popping up all over the place, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of psychedelic-assisted therapy training programs. And that's one of the questions is, like, how do you really uh, assist people in psychedelic-assisted therapy if you really don't know what that uh, psychedelic experience is like? And I think that really the, the jury's still out on that. Largely, I think there's consensus that uh, to be truly empathic and to be really present with people and to know the, the territory that you're working in, to have a psychedelic experience, one or more, is a, is a good tool uh, to have in your toolkit to, to be of real value and assistance. But like we were saying before, there's so many different ways to have non-ordinary states of consciousness. Yeah, yeah, yeah produced so you know it's not as though uh, people who have never used a psychedelic but have had deep profound consciousness changing experiences through uh, a near-death experience through a sweat lodge through breath work uh, they know the landscape pretty well too I agree. and, they, and I agree. they can be present for people so is it required I don't think it's required there's consensus that it's a it's a valuable tool to have and certainly if we take ketamine as a model we haven't talked about ketamine at all but ketamine is a a legal psychedelic like drug uh, it's a shorter acting kind of experience it does produce changes of consciousness significant and a lot of the training programs employ uh, an experiential component where someone has uh, ketamine lozenge uh, experience or, or an IM or IV ketamine experience as mm -hmm. part of their training um. I changed your thoughtfully worded title to a clickbaity one where it said, you know, psychedelic therapy coming to Vermont, big, bold. I guess I should ask then uh, to, 
to um, to make it actually work. When is this coming to Vermont? You know, when can we expect that we'll see something practical, the practical use of psychedelics in Vermont? And if you were to make a guess, sorry for my compound questions, but if you were going to guess, what will come first? So we have legal ketamine, and that seems to be increasing in its use um, for better, for worse, in different ways. Legal ketamine mean legal mean ketamine. Me legal medicinally or legal yep. legal uh, medicinally. Yep. And also just there's like people prescribe ketamine online and you get a, a ketamine delivered to your home and you take it at home. So it's, it's pretty widespread access. I'm more of a person who believes in the, the therapeutic model of ketamine use. So you're doing it in the context of psychotherapy, not mm -hmm. just dosing at home and, you know, maybe talking to your therapist about it or not if you have one. Um, but so ketamine's legal. That's happening. Uh, and the next up is MDMA, Molly Ecstasy. Uh, MDMA will be uh, FDA approved and ready for prime time uh, legal access, I would say probably mid to late 2024. And do you think that one is, will be next because it's so much fun? <laughs> like, <laughs> you, no, I feel like I'm only half kidding. I mean, right. there's like the, the idea of MDMA is, um, I think people think happiness. Right. I mean, I don't know. I, I, know that there, I know that there's a societal understanding and like a legal conversation to be had. Right. If you were going to guess why, in my experience, which is anecdotal, people aren't scared, like drug war scared of something like MDMA. Although I know that it's been part of the drug war and people. Yeah, I think MDMA on. actually got a uh, short shrift uh, back in the day in the, in the late 90s, uh, late 80s. I, uh, I had a man, I, I keep interrupting, but I've had Emmanuel Spherios on the podcast before too, okay. who, who went on six, uh, from Dance Safe, who started yeah. Dance Safe. And uh, he talked about how he went on uh, 60 Minutes and people were just, it was just straw man after straw man. Just the segment he thought was supposed to be reporting harm reduction and what is MDMA and why could people use it safely? It was, why are you wrong? You know, or, so, so yeah, I know, I know, I know that it's, yeah. it's been shortchanged too. It's been shortchanged and, 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 it, and it is, I, I do think the reason why it is first up in the queue is because a lot of work done by this organization called MAPS, going back to the, mm -hmm. uh, uh, founded in 1986 and uh, starting research in the late 90s or at least trying to get research going and then there's been a preponderance of research there at the end of their phase three, second phase three clinical trials which have been, uh, the results have been released, they haven't been published yet in a peer-reviewed journal, but um, it's just the furthest along in the research process, which is a long, arduous process. And so they're right on the cusp of FDA approval uh, by the end of 2023, uh, early 2024, and then there's like a 90-day lag of DEA has to review, the Drug Enforcement Agency has to review a few things and give their stamp on it. So um, I, I think it's not because it's so much fun, although MDMA is considered to be the love drug and a very yeah. empathy-producing drug. I've, I've used uh, plenty of it back in the day. And, uh, and it does have that reputation, um, but it, as a legal, as a medicinal legal uh, drug to help treat post-traumatic stress disorder, the results have been pretty significant. And so that's why it's been fast-tracked, and, and that's why we're going to see that one next. And, and after that, well, like I said earlier, it would be psilocybin, but probably not till uh, 2025, 2026 at the earliest. Okay. Yep. I can wait. Yeah, but thank you so much for everything today. How how can people find you? Do podcasts all the time. How can people find you talking about this stuff, maybe in a longer form than this? And I know that because of the Psychedelic Society of Vermont, that's, that's what it's called. Yeah, um, there are resources there, and I know you have offered a summit before last year, and I don't know if you'll be doing that again. Yeah, so. I said at the beginning we're going to do a conference. Oh, that's right. Yep, you September twenty first to twenty third in Stowe. And yeah, you can find me on Twitter. You know, that's where we met many, many, many that's years right. ago. Good place to meet. Yep. And uh, so I'm pretty active on Twitter and uh, the website, this uh, vermontpsychedelic.org. And uh, yeah, you can Google my name and find me and reach out. And I've, I'm happy to answer questions. Cool. Rick, thank you so much for being on. Yeah, it's good to be here. Good Thanks. talking to you. Yeah, it's great. Thanks for joining. We were talking to Dr. Rick Barnett about psychedelic assisted therapy in Vermont.